I'm Darius McDermott from Fun Calibre, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Nichols and Mark Heslop, co-manager of the Jupiter European Fund. And Mark Heslop also co-manages the Jupiter European Smaller Companies Fund, both of which are Elite Radar rated. Morning, guys. Thanks very much for coming to talk to us about uh, European equities this morning. You inherited um, a really big fund, $4 billion. Um, but it's quite concentrated and you have some, some, some large holdings, the biggest being Relex, which represents about 7% of the fund. What do you like so much about this company and how do you about, go about getting enough conviction in a firm to put so much money in it? Yeah, good morning, Darius. Um, you know, for us, um, it's all about stock selection. So our entire process is about picking great companies. And the way that we think about position sizing is the combination of conviction in the company we're investing in and the valuation and the upside it offers. Uh, and when we think about a company like Relex, what gives us that conviction in it? Well, we think it's a great, high-quality growth compounder. It's over many years, it's built up a huge store of data, and it's invested heavily to build a, a tech stack that sits behind that, that allows it to analyze that data to produce positive outcomes for all of its customers. You know, whether that's helping an insurance company price the risk of a particular customer more efficiently, whether it's helping a doctor uh, give better treatment to a cancer patient. Um, Relix is out there trying to invent and develop solutions um, that improve uh, productivity or improve people's lives. And they've got a very strong track record, a very long track record of being able to do that very consistently. Uh, and we believe there's every reason they can continue to do that in the years going forwards. When we think about the other side of it, the valuation, this is a company that trades on about a 5% free cash flow yield uh, and which we think can grow earnings consistently at, at about 10% or more per annum. That should lead you to be able to, to earn about a 15% annualized rate of return, which against most of the other opportunities we see out there in the market looks very attractive. And it's also worth remembering at the moment that Relic should probably be growing above that sort of rate for the next uh, couple of years at least as we get reopening and we see some of their businesses um, delivering a higher level of activity. So a very attractive uh, growth compounder and attractive valuation. And the combination of the two drives the, the, the large weighting in the fund. Another area which I know you're, you're keen on at the moment and overweight – in the fund is industrial and consumer discretionary firms. What do you particularly like about those at the moment? And um, maybe if you could just touch on what type of company they are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, again, you know, Mark, Mark mentioned that we, we really are bottom up stock pickers. Um, and the weightings that we have in individual sectors are, are really a function of that, that process of identifying great companies. And what we're looking for is we're looking for companies that, that really are the highest quality companies that we can find within the European universe and companies that have exposure to long-term secular growth. And as a consequence of that focus, and, and it is a very clear focus that we have, we do end up with um, some fairly consistent underweights and also overweights um, with regard to certain sectors. So there are some sectors where we, we really can't find what we believe are the highest quality companies. There are some sectors which really we don't believe have long-term um, secular growth opportunities that, that, that we can get exposure to. Um, I think when it comes to the industrials and also some of the consumer spaces, um, Europe really does have some world leading companies. We, you know, we've got companies that have uh, very dominant market positions. Um, so, so, for example, in the industrial space, we own a company called VAT Group. Uh, this is a Swiss company that has a 70% market share um, globally. Uh, in uh, vacuum equipment, which is used in the manufacturing of semiconductor chips. Um, so as we see this, this very strong demand for semiconductor chips over the next decade and, and beyond, uh, we need to build more fabs to, to, to manufacture these products. And in that manufacturing process, you need a very um, high uh, quality vacuum. Um, and this is a company that generates very high levels of profitability, has very strong market shares, and will benefit from that long-term growth opportunity that we see. I think in the consumer space, um, we, we, you know, 
Europe has a heritage uh, of of high quality brands which are desired the world over. Um, so in the luxury goods space, we own LVMH, uh, we own Adidas, um, and we also in in the beverage space own some uh, some of the uh, uh, spirits companies. So including Perno and, and also Campari. Now my next question, and I'm guessing. I, I know this is a stock selection answer, but you've got decent weightings in France, Germany, and Switzerland. I, I, is there anything about those sort of countries that that, that stand out for, or, or is it just that's just where these great companies are listed? I, I, yeah, I think I think you, you've hit the nail on the head there. I mean, we, once again, you know, we're very bottom up, and, and frankly, we don't really care where the headquarters of a company is, um, yeah, and in the majority sure. of um, cases in the portfolio, our companies are global leaders in what they do. So, so they're not just um, domestic companies that are focused on the German economy. Um, they're global leaders. Uh, and as a consequence of that, we really don't care uh, where the company's headquartered. And so the, the weightings that we have for individual country, countries is just a function uh, of the output of the process and, and the stock picking that, that we do. So we always like to talk about a stock that people will have heard of, um, and they may not have heard about Relex, but I'm guessing most people have heard of Adidas, which you mentioned briefly before. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about Adidas um, and what it is that, 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 again, you particularly like about that name today. Sure. Yeah. We, I mean, we're as familiar with the three stripes uh, uh, as everyone else is. So um you know, in some ways, that's a good starting point. It's a brand you've heard of. It's a brand that people understand. They they get that association, particularly with soccer. It's the, it's the, the only real international sport out there. And they are uh, at least one of the most prominent brands in that and have a rich heritage going back to Adi Dassler creating um, those iconic football boots uh, uh, that started the, the company off. Um but it's not enough. You know, it's not enough as an investment just to have a good brand uh, and to be recognizable. What what we like about Adidas is, is that the, the, the company's always had that commercial appeal, but for a long period of time, it lacked execution to go alongside it. So it never really gave consistent uh, profitability. It never really converted that commercial appeal into consistent earnings growth and cash flow generation. Uh, we've seen a new management team come in over the last five years. They've uh, got rid of all the all the stuff that wasn't Adidas branded out of the portfolio. So golf, hockey, um, Reeboks on its way out. All of these distractions that underperformed are on their way out of the portfolio. Uh, and the company is focusing back in on that iconic brand, which has delivered double digit uh, revenue growth for about 15 years now. Pretty consistent, high, high levels of revenue growth. Uh, speaks to the attractiveness of the brand. Um, but they're now starting to deliver the margins alongside that as well. So focusing in on the core brand, um, focusing on pricing, focusing on innovation, delivering products that appeal to consumers, and benefiting from this ability to, to sell directly to consumers online is a massive part of the investment case. As the um, direct-to-consumer online channel grows, it's now about 20% of the, the company's uh, annual sales. As that grows in the mix, you're selling more of your product directly to consumers who you get to know because they sign up for your app. Um, there's, I think, something in the order of 200 million people have signed up and downloaded the Adidas app. You sell the product to them at full price. You can start offering limited editions, which go at even higher price points and limited quantities and build that brand halo um, around the, the other products in the portfolio. So we think Adidas is a brand that's improving, but more importantly, it's a company that's improving. And the combination of the two should create this investment opportunity that creates shareholder value for, for, um, for many years to come. And of course, you know, it's a big company. Sometimes being a big company doesn't make money for shareholders. Uh, it just attracts more competition. In this case, you've got Adidas and Nike as the two behemoths in that, in that sportswear industry. Both of them is targeting higher margins, higher profitability, at revenue growth. And that's a really nice combination. Two dominant players, they're about 60% of the industry combined, and both of them is acting sensibly and trying to drive shareholder returns up. And that's that's really the icing on the cake for us on the investment case. Mark Nichols, Mark Heslop, thank you very much for your time. If you would like more information on the Jupiter European Fund or the Jupiter European Smaller Companies Fund, 
please visit fundcalibre.com. <laughs>